So our societies, our cultures are organized like a cultural onion, like an onion which represents culture with its different layers. At the center is the uh, worldview, the answers to those ultimate questions. That's in the center. And then around that center is the power system and then the value system, practices, and finally the, uh, the things that we make, like I'm writing with this chalk. That's the cultural system. And um, what happens is that we take our cultural system and we turn that system into our God. In other words, we say, God is like my culture. So when David Schenk gets up in the morning and he looks in the mirror, he says, I am a mirror image of God. My cultural system is what I understand to be my religious system, my cultural system, its divinity. Uh, in psychology, we call this, in the English language, we call this psychoprojection. Psychoprojection, where we project God to be the image of our culture. Sigmund Freud, the psychoanalyst, used to say when he was living that our religions are the psycho projection of our fathers, that the father image becomes our understanding of what God is about, and the God we worship is like our fathers. All of that is to say that we worship a God, we worship gods or a God that looks like our culture. In other words, if my culture looks like a square, then the God I worship is like a square. So I project God to be like my culture. It was a Greek philosopher, Xenophanes, a Greek philosopher by the name of Xenophanes, used to say, it is interesting that um, Horses, it's interesting that black people worship gods that are black with flat noses. That black people with flat noses worship gods who are black and have flat, no flat noses. And white people who have long noses worship gods that look like white people with long noses. So he said, apparently, the gods we worship are the invention of our minds. And he goes on to say, I think if horses worship gods, then the gods would look like horses, the psychoprojection of divinity. So every culture forming its god that it worships in the form of its own culture. And so we psychoproject God and, um, and, and, and form God into our, into our own image. Now what about that? What about that? It's a universal phenomenon. And you see it especially in times of war. A war is coming, and all at once, God is on our side. I remember when uh, the uh, first Iraq war took place, that the world press had, had uh, President George Bush going to pray, and Saddam Hussein going to the mosque to pray, Bush going to a church to pray, and Saddam Hussein going to a mosque to pray, uh, although I don't think Bush went to, 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 to a church. He, he had someone come in to pray with him. But that was seen. You know, the president's praying. Saddam Hussein is praying. Praying to God to do what? Give us a victory, I guess. You see? And so we, we, we co-opt God to look like our national agenda, even when it is like going to war. Yeah. So what about that? How do, how do we deal with that reality? That's one reason you have so many religions. Uh, because every culture, we talked about relativism today, 
cultures tend to form divinities who, that look like their cultures and uh, worship gods that look like their cultures. And so we have multiple religions and cultures and so forth uh, because of that phenomenon that we tend to invent God in our own mind, in our own figure. Yeah. Now, what does the Bible say about that? What does the Bible say about that? I like to read a passage from the scriptures, uh, from the Bible. I will read Jeremiah 10, 1 to 6. Hear what the Lord says to you, people of Israel. This is what the Lord is. Do not learn the ways of the nations or be terrified by signs in the heavens, though the nations are terrified by them. For the practices of the peoples are worthless. Listen carefully. They cut a tree out of the forest, and a craftsman shapes it with his chisel. They adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails, so it will not totter. Verse 5. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field, their idols cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them. They can do no harm, nor can they do any good. This idol is created by people. They take a tree, they cut it down, they carve it in the form of an idol, they put silver on it and so forth, and then they bow down and worship the creation of their hands. They worship the projection of their culture. And what does the prophet Jeremiah say about that? He says, these gods have no power. They have no authority. They are the invention of people, of the nations. They are not true gods. <laughs> so don't fear them. Look at verse 6. No one is like you, Lord. You are great and your name is mighty in power. Who should not fear you? King of the nations, this is your due. Among all the wise leaders of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is no one like you. What's he saying? He's saying these gods that are fashioned after our culture are false gods. The true God is the God who created you, not the God whom you and I create. Get it? The true God is the one who created us, not the God whom we created. And so the Bible refers to this worship of the gods that we create as idolatry. And you, you will remember the Ten Commandments. The very first commands have to do with this phenomenon. You shall have no other gods beside your Creator, is what the Ten Commandments proclaim. And you shall not make any image of any god that you worship, for the Creator cannot be captured in any images. It's not the image that you create. He is the God who created you. Don't create God. Let Him create you. Don't create Him, you see. So this is, this is a universal phenomenon in religions everywhere. And biblical faith says, yes, that's true. People do worship gods that they create with their own hands, but those gods are false gods. Worship only the God who created you, not the God whom you create. And this is why, this is why in the Bible, from Genesis chapter 3 all the way to Revelation 22, the last chapter of the Bible, there is a consistent message from the Bible, and that consistent message is repent. Repent. Now, when you study Hinduism, you don't study about repentance, you see. When you study Buddhism, you don't study about repentance. Repentance is a biblical understanding, and Islam and Judaism, uh, to some extent, embrace that, that commitment as well. Um, these Abrahamic faiths, they call us repent, you see. 
although within Islam, uh, there's more of an emphasis on submitting to the will of God, submitting to the will of God. But repentance is there. Repent. Turn away from the God that you worship. This is why in Islam there's such a complete prohibition of making any images at all in the mosque. You go to a mosque, you'll never see an image of anything. You'll see scriptures written, instructions from God, but never an image. Never. Never. You see. This, 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 this call to, to, to repent of forming God in any images that we create um, and of, uh, of uh, uh, and, and any gods that we, that, we, that, we, that we project. So that's why repentance means turn around. So within biblical faith, the picture is of us going in this direction, creating God in our own image and so forth, and God calls us turn around. Shub is the biblical term, the Hebrew term, shub, turn around, turn around and go in the other direction. Turn around from what? Turn around from forming God in your own image and rather let the God who created you form you, you see. So repentance is very, very central to biblical faith. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TBS Ministry. For more information, please visit tbsseminary.com. I, I remember years ago when I was uh, doing my graduate studies, my doctoral studies at the University of, of uh, in New York University, and uh, my professor used to say that a distinctive of the biblical faith is, is the righteous, personal, creator God who encounters us calling for repentance. And he's right, that's distinctive. That's distinctive of the Christian faith. When you look at the Christian faith amidst all other religions, you know, that is really distinctive. The righteous, personal, creative God who encounters us calling for repentance, you see. Now, um, uh, Islam has more of an emphasis. I don't mean that there's none of that there, but is Islam particularly emphasizes uh, the submission to the will of God. In biblical faith, it is to turn around and relate to God, to meet him. Uh, the righteous personal God who meets us and calls us to, uh, to turn around and repent. Yeah. The heart of biblical faith. And so God's plan, God's plan is that we not only repent, but that God becomes the center of our culture core. That our core, our center, that's, that's God's plan. That's God's invitation. That instead of worshiping the gods whom we create, we now invite God into the center of our worldview. And he begins to transform. 